Hello, I am Li Xiaoming from Peking University, China. At Peking University, my primary job is a professor in computer science. Five years ago, the university set up a task force for online teaching and blended learning. And uh, I was appointed as the head of the task force. Since then, I've been involved in the MOOCs and the blended teaching activities in many ways. It is my honor to share with you my experience and the thoughts over last five years in this occasion. And I'm sorry for not being able to be with you in person. Let me begin with a Weibo post I put up on January 23rd, 2013. That was five years ago. At the time, people in China started getting aware of the English acronym MOOC and was looking for a proper Chinese translation. There were quite a few initial translations were used. The post I put up was just asking opinion from the public. As it involved, the first one prevails and achieved consensus. In China, a lot of things happened during the last five years around MOOCs, and people are actually inspired by what has happened. As a result, the Ministry of Education conducted a grant meeting on MOOCs and the blended teaching on January 15, 2018, summarizing the achievement and encouraging more to do in this area. One of the highlights in this meeting was giving a title, something like National Action MOOC, to about 500 MOOCs which run at least two sessions and meet certain criteria. As MOE indicated, more than 3,000 MOOCs were produced in China during the last five years and uh, 500 of them were recognized as excellent this time. By announcing 2,500 more national excellent MOOCs to be identified in the years to come, the ministry encourages the universities and the professors to make more MOOCs for the public and also blend them with classroom activities. Personally, I think I have not only closely witnessed, but also proactively participated in the MOOC movement in China during the last five years. As such, I'll brief some of the activities I experienced and my reflections in what follows. The first account is my proud and is to my amusement. To learn what a good MOOC may be like, I seriously took a course by Cornell University on edX and earned a certificate with a score 100%. The 10 weeks experience with the course was not only worthy, but also wonderful. I have made two MOOCs in 2013 and 2015 respectively. These are the certificates I signed for those who complete them. My MOOCs were purposely run on different platforms, including Alex, Coursera, and quite a few Chinese. As a result, we not only learned how to make and teach MOOCs, but also gained some hands-on experiences with different MOOC platforms. Once you have a MOOC, it is tempting to blend it with classroom activities so that one can experience a new mode of teaching. I started doing this in 2013. The red squares on this slide shows the eight blended teaching sessions I conducted. It was challenging in the beginning and the process becomes streamlined after about three trials. To me, it actually becomes a preferred practice. During past five years, Peking University has launched more than 100 MOOCs involving more than 
100 faculty members, their ages ranging from 30 to 80. Subjects across science, humanity, engineering, computing, and medicine. As head of MOOC task force, seeing our university's MOOC launches one after another, and finally reaching its 100 goal, it was truly a joyful experience. Meanwhile, we got some donation, which allows us to build a MOOC platform and run it since 2015. To me, the purpose of this platform is distinct from others. It just provides open and free opportunities for individuals who just want to run the MOOC without financial objective. As such, the cost needed to keep it running is minimized. So, we have experienced MOOC and blended teaching in these five aspects. If we see them as a set of tasks, we can realize substantial efforts are needed and many people needed to be involved to accomplish them. Last a few months, we have been reflecting on the matters, trying to identify the drive behind them. To me, besides some tangible resources provided by the university to support operations, belief is an essential key. The leadership should believe that online and blended teaching and learning is indeed the future of higher education. And what we do now will not be a waste, will have no regret. And it is high time to start doing it now. As a consequence of this belief, open and inclusive should be a basic strategy, which essentially means open opportunities to all faculties, everyone is welcome, not only celebrities. Also, as a consequence of this belief, pragmatism should be the basic approach in moving things forward. For example, DIY of MOOC production by faculty themselves is encouraged, in addition to providing studio environment for those who want it. Besides the three points, a simple and persistent message passing around the campus over the years is also crucial. We all understand the existence of hesitations and skepticism, and in fact, the rationals behind them are strong. A simple and persistent message helps encourage those who want to be pioneers and those enthusiastic followers. From the both experiences, I have also learned a lot. In terms of micro aspects, I feel that seriously learning a serious MOOC is indeed valuable. Of course, seriously reading a serious book is also valuable. What I want to emphasize here is the effectiveness. If you spend 30 hours on a MOOC, the learning outcome is presumably more than spending 30 hours on a comparable textbook. Being pragmatic, it is proved that producing a good MOOC is not necessary to incur unbearable workload. Once again, I want to compare with writing a textbook. In general, I feel that producing a quality MOOC takes no more effort than writing a textbook. There are many ways in blending a MOOC with classroom activities. The space for innovation is huge. Once you get used to some model, which implies that you can do it routinely with regular teaching time and energy, you'll like it. For me, I struggled about three sessions before getting onto a comfortable zone, which is blended but not truly flipped. In my opinion, flipped classroom is a special type of blended teaching. I tried but felt 
quite challenge. Perhaps it is because my class, about 100 students, is too big for doing it. As for students' responses to blended teaching, we did some poll asking them which teaching mode is preferred, traditional or blended. The result is encouraged. Most of them voted for the new paradigm. Furthermore, among our MOOC instructors, there are about 20 faculties blending their MOOCs with classroom teaching. One way or another, we held some workshop among the faculties to share experiences. And we see the spectrum of practices is wide. But one thing is in common, that is, once you go through a few sessions of blended teaching, most probably you'll stick to it. What we see in this table is the standard in-house student evaluations for teaching. Five courses are listed here as the rows, across five semesters as the columns. The orange color indicated the evaluations for blended teaching, and before the orange indicated the traditional teaching. The overall conclusion is clear that after transforming a to blended teaching mode, a course gets better evaluation from students, which confirms what the previous poll indicated. In terms of macro issues, by macro, I want to address the issues from a university or a country's point of view. How MOOCs and blended teaching to be further promoted in a sustainable way. In general, there are four kinds of directions. The first two are related to producing MOOCs, and the last two are related to blended teaching. In my opinion, item A, that is more courses, should still be the priority. It is the basis for other items. Although in China, we had 3,000 MOOCs launched in past five years. That's not enough for pervasive practices of blended teaching, and not enough for destructive changes to happen. As I said earlier, Chinese Ministry of Education has determined 2,500 more national excellent MOOCs in the years to come. A simple regression would require 15,000 MOOCs as the base population. To go a little further, I would say that 10 times more MOOCs available is essential for the business we are talking about really prevails. To this end, I propose something called a MOOC Development Index, which consists of three factors related to learning of anyone anytime and anywhere. By existence, we ask whether or not a typical university course has a MOOC version. By awareness, we ask if a learner knows what he wants actually exists. By availability, we ask if someone wants to learn from an existing MOOC, whether he can do it now. We know a MOOC may not be open all the time. Thus, existence does not imply available now. If the MDI is to know, learning of anyone, anytime, and anywhere will be kept just as a wish only. So, MOOC Development Index, what's the current status? For the situation in China, I estimate existence Point two, awareness, point two, and availability, point five. Overall, the current MDI is 2%, which means we really have a long way to go. But we have some good news. That is, we know how to work on it. To improve existence, create more MOOCs, to improve awareness, promote MOOCs in the society, to improve availability, have MOOCs really open 
to allow multiple copies existing on the internet so that if one copy is not in session, another one might be. We have been experiencing MOOCs and the blended teaching for five years. One thing seemingly have reached the consensus that blended teaching is the future. Still questions are how MOOCs will be related to that future or will not be related at all and how we can justify the value of independent MOOCs from the universities and the professors' point of view. My conjecture is that MOOCs can be a cost-effective means serving the two purposes, a component of blended teaching and a vehicle carrying universities' new value in the information age. Well, that's all I want to share with you today. And thank you for your attention.